Thanks for checking out this movie review video. So this is for the 1988 release Black Roses. Yes, the hair metal, 80s hair metal uh, horror film. And I don't do this often, but I'm going to dedicate this review to someone. Uh, I've done it like once or twice before, but I have to dedicate this one to Brianna Whipple uh, on Twitter. She's Brianimator. She is a horror writer. I know her most as a horror journalist who writes things for Rue Morgue Magazine, which, you know, I've love Rue Morgue Mag Magazine and been reading for about 13 years. I've been a subscriber, something like that. But anyway, I'm dedicating this one to her because this is the type of film that's right up her alley. Don't know if she's seen it yet or not. I'd assume she probably has. But um, she is very committed to 80s hair metal, metal look and culture, and I have never seen a person that dedicated to it, and I have a lot of respect for that. You know, do what you love and commit to it, and that's what she's doing. So this is dedicated to her, because I have a feeling that she'll enjoy Black Roses if she's seen it or hasn't. I have a feeling she's into it. Anyway, directed by John Fasano, who did uh, Rock and Roll Nightmare and The Jitters, uh, written by Cindy Surreal, who didn't write any other scripts. Not that big of a surprise here. This is a trauma film, and as people may know, it feels like a trauma film. What I mean by that is it's very face value with pretty much everything. There's not a whole lot of subtextual anything to the film. And anything that could be subtextual, they make a point to make not subtextual. To just like be right in your face and they're like, we'll just have the, the characters tell you what should be subtext. But that's trauma and obviously they've been doing it for decades so it's working. The other thing is it always has this kind of like goofy playful feel to trauma films and this one definitely has that. Which... Obviously, it should with what the premise is for it. Interesting piece of information here. Actor Frank Dietz, who played the character of Johnny, who I felt like was going to be like the main character when it was first introduced, and then he really didn't end up being in it as much as I thought he would. He kind of like disappeared for a large chunk of the film, honestly. He had a big enough role in it, but I thought he was going to be like the main, main character. But anyway, actor Frank Dietz, who played Johnny, uh, was 46 when the film came out. Now, I'm sure people who've seen this can definitely tell that, because uh, as a teenager in high school, he looked like he was 40-something. 40, 40 I mean, look, I am 40 years old, and he looked older than me. He looked, in the film, older than I look now, I would say. Almost exactly. I mean, the hair's probably different. Like, he was not balding. He had wonderful locks good for him, but um, yeah, I definitely look younger than he did when he did the film. Uh, <laughs> it's one of those things, though, like in the 80s, they did that a lot where people playing, you know, people in high school were always a lot older, and it's just something we accepted back then, and I mean, for that reason, I still accept it now. The opening scene with the demon band, which I really love that, that start to the film, it, it's a lot of fun. Uh, that took actually three weeks to shoot that. It was the longest they spent in production on one entire scene. And uh, yeah, you can probably see why. I mean, a lot of prosthetics involved, a lot of artistry in how they were shooting it and getting the music in there. And it was, it was a fun way to start. So I'm, I'm glad they took the three weeks to execute it properly. And then I like how basically they come full circle at the very end of the film by going back to that opening scene to show you what ends up happening. Starting with the concert is fun, especially since the band members look like odd demons, but why didn't they actually save that f for the end to kind of build up to it? I guess they did in a sense, but as I was watching the film, I was wondering, why did they show any demon aspect first? Because most films wouldn't do that. But then again, this is trauma, so I guess I answer my own question by saying that uh, it's trauma. So, uh, But most films would probably start with the band just being the band, and then eventually they'd start looking like demons, but in this film they actually do end it where the dem demonic uh, state of Damien, the lead singer, ends up being way more grandiose, so it does like one-up itself in that sense, so that's fine. The animated vines and sparkling title in the road in the beginning as these very nice cars kind of roll over it is amazingly cheesy and 80s, and I love that as how the title comes up. Because a lot of those films back then, they would just like pop the title up with just like normal font. It's just like, okay, it's Black Roses. But 
the fact that they went the extra mile to have it like this animated sparkling uh, title with all like these animated vines on the road. Nice touch. Nice touch, Troma. I'm a fan. The tie-in with the Walt Whitman quote about evil propelling people works as a way to get the point of the film through very, very early. Uh, initially, it actually feels like it's okay, because even though the characters are literally telling you what could have been subtext, um, it, it feels natural, though, because they're in that class forum discussion, uh, forum, sorry, forum uh, format that Morehouse talks about when he's like, okay, let's get in a forum, and they all get in the circle and start, you know, talking about these types of things. So it feels natural because when I was in high school, we did that. Like, we literally did that, where we'd put our desks in a circle and talk about a book or poetry or whatever, so it works. But then I feel like after that, they just start to get too in your face about what could have been subtext, and they're just telling you exactly what is going on. Exact like with uh, Mayor Farnsworth, where he's talking to the community and he's saying, well, isn't this just like when you were young and you had... Uh, you know, a band that your parents said was, you know, the devil's music and it was going to turn you bad and all this stuff. And he starts name, naming like, you know, Elvis, the Beatles, all that stuff, which it's a good point, but you can bring it up in a much different way. That's not just like character telling you exactly what it is. It can be brought up in different ways. But then again, this is trauma. That's really not what trauma does. They're very face value. They just throw it at you and they're like, this is a simple film. Enjoy it. And there is a decent amount to enjoy here. Um, I do think that the use of the poetry of like Emerson and Whitman does make sense in this. And it is a little bit of a subtextual thing because their, their writings are mainly about, you know, figuring out your place in life, figuring out who you are as a human being. So that's literally what's going on in the lives of teenagers at that point. So it kind of embodies this bit of like the push and pull of them, you know, being involved with school and trying to be good kids and, and be good students. But then they also just want to go out and have fun and go to this concert and be influenced by the bad things that this demon band is telling them. Although, you know, at that point, it's not actually their choice because they're being controlled by demonic forces, which is a great excuse for messing things up. <laughs> uh, What's Morehouse doing just roaming around the town at night? He seems like an extreme creeper. Now, I don't know if they were trying to set that up as in he just got out of like that town hall meeting with Mayor Farnsworth and he just happened to be in the area and then he foiled Johnny's plot to literally paint the town red as he was going to do. Uh, but it just seemed weird that he was just out kind of like walking around when it's dark and there's like no one else on the streets. He seems like a real creeper. Now, he seems like even more of a creeper because he's actively stringing along Julie because he can tell at numerous times in the film that she has this uh, crush on him. And he does nothing to squash it until she's about to turn into an actual demon and try and kill him. Uh, and he just, like, strings her along. And it's it literally seems like he's trying to leave that on that option on the table for himself of like, you know, uh, I really shouldn't do this because she's a teenager, but uh, my libido says, let's bone this. Uh, let's just leave the option on the table for now. Well, I think this through some more like that's literally how he seems as a character. So I know he's supposed to be like the hero, but for that reason, doesn't really feel like a hero to me. Not at all. But then again, that's fine. Cause it's a trauma film. <laughs> There's literally a part where Johnny is talking and there's no audio. This is when they're going to start their second forum discussion in school with Morehouse. And Johnny starts talking and there's no audio. Like his lips are moving and there's nothing. And then finally it cuts in. Good job. <laughs> Obviously it's a ruse when the Black Roses dress in white and end up playing ballads at the school. That's obviously a show that they're just putting on for the parents and the mayor and everyone to be like, look, our music is totally fine. Let us play in your community, which I don't understand. Like, I guess Morehouse questions it at one point. Like, why would you be here playing these concerts? And they're just like, oh, well, 
we want to use this as kind of like a test run, like can we catch on other places? And this is like a microcosm for how our career can be, and then we'll leave the town if everything's good, which they do in the end, and that's after, you know, they cause all that havoc, and people think they killed them, but they didn't. But, um, yeah, it's, it's something. <laughs> So they're, they're lulled into this false sense of safety, the parents are. So then they'd be like, oh, kids, go ahead, go to this concert. These very nice, uh, you know, buttoned up, dressed in white, black roses, perfect. You see the influence of black roses in the students immediately after the concert. There's no, there's no lapse in time. There's no kind of like gradual anything. It's immediate. The students are all of a sudden not interested in participating in class or really thinking about anything that matters in life at that point. It seems like they're very much whatever about everything and into demonic anarchy, in essence. And then eventually it gets to the point of killing their parents, which I'll talk about the implications of that in just horror in general later. Oh, wow. Vincent Pastor as Tony's dad. The guy, uh, I'm not going to say his name because YouTube uh, algorithm stuff, but... Um, Big P from The Sopranos. You know what I'm talking about. So that was shocking to see him. And he has the best death in this, by the way. That speaker creature that comes out and attacks him, even though the attack scene goes on too long, in my opinion, and it's just too drawn out for what it is, um, it's the best death in the film by far, in my opinion. Love it. Uh, and I'm glad it was him who got, got to have that fun. Morehouse ends up listening to classical music while he's at home drinking a beer just to show that he is the true opposite to the Black Roses in this and that he is supposed to be the hero that saves the day. Foreshadowing right there. Uh, funny when the kid is throwing his action figures in the fire at, while he's listening to Black Roses and says that who he was throwing in were the bad guys because it was Batman and Aquaman. Obviously not the bad guys, but this is meant to just show you that even this very young kid is being turned just by listening to the music of the Black Roses. He's starting to see good and want to do away with it because he's becoming so evil, those Black Roses. Why was Johnny wearing a glove when he shot his father? It was, he was literally wearing a black glove when they show the hand with the, with the pistol. Why was it, like, I don't think there was a portion in there where he was put a glove on. Because he literally had just gotten out of bed. He didn't even have a shirt on. And then all of a sudden he's got a black glove when he's shooting his dad in the head. I don't get it. It was very odd. But, you know, whatever. Trauma. Julie cutting Priscilla's throat was actually a pretty decent kill. That's probably the second best kill in my opinion. Uh, Morehouse actually is a creep since he was stringing Julie around. I already talked about that. Uh, Julie's demon form is actually pretty awesome. Now, Damien's demon form, like, full demon form is pretty awesome, too. But I would argue that Julie's, I'm sure most people feel me on this, too. Julie's is way better. Like, that, her full demon form looks so cool, uh, that I kind of wish that that was Damien's demon form, because that would have made the fight scene at the end with Morehouse better, in my opinion. But, the fight scene with Morehouse... And Julie, as a demon, is pretty awesome. I really did enjoy that. And I was very impressed with the design of Demon Julie. Very into that. In the end, the title Black Roses is actually more about the teens than it is about the band. Because obviously Damien ends up referring to all the teens that he's demonically turning as his roses, as his flowers, his black roses. So going into the film, as you assume that the title's about the actual band, it's really more about the teens and that they are kind of the seedlings that are being sprinkled with the demonic uh, nutrients that are the, that is the music of the black roses to turn into black roses instead of growing up to become white roses, which is obviously what, you know, parents are afraid of. What a weird final shot of the film with Damien's face and then someone saying evil and then it just stops on it and then everything else goes black. I mean, there are many other ways to end that, many more interesting ways to end that, or just not weird ways to end that like that. So, I don't know, odd choice in my opinion. The awful corny nature of the soundtrack in this film really stands out as being particularly bad because it stands in contrast to that initial song, the hair metal song in the very beginning, that is fun, and there are other hair metal songs throughout the film, so thank goodness 
the one in the intro wasn't the only one because that's the best music. But other than that, much like a lot of trauma films, the music is just like corny and hokey and just not good. The other thing is it doesn't match the film, especially when you set the film up as about like this 80s hair metal band you need to have music that matches that basically especially because you lead with playing one of their songs that sets the tone for what the soundtrack should be i think they kind of messed up on that but you know they can't just keep doing hair metal throughout it because i think it'd probably be more pricey for them and trauma <laughs> This is obviously playing off the accusations that have been made many, many, many times throughout history that me uh, metal music and rock music in general is the devil's music, and the lead singer being named Damien is obviously a nod to the Omen, uh, the child of Satan named Damien in the Omen, which I've only actually seen the first Omen film. I need to see more. That's been a while. But, um, yeah, this, this just plays to that. Like, it's been... I feel like every single decade this comes up again that I keep hearing in the media that parents are calling, you know, certain music the devil's music again and thinking that, you know, kids listening to that music is going to make them go out and and uh, cause them to do terrible things, including murdering people. And so this film is really taking those accusations that were very active during that time. Uh, in 1988 and just blowing them out of proportion and saying this is ridiculous so let's make a movie showing you literally how ridiculous that it, this is i mean that is basically what horror in general does it takes the most ridiculous societal fears puts a mirror up to it and it's one of those kind of funhouse mirrors that distorts the hell out of things and makes it ridiculous and that's one of the reasons i love horror so much um so i like that aspect of this film this also plays deeply on the fear of raising children and how that can go poorly for parents. Uh, parents end up worrying on uh, or worrying about all the influences within society that can have a tendency to, as in their minds, take their children down the wrong path. You know, parents. I'm not a parent myself, so I'm, you know, speaking through what I what I do know and what I've heard, uh, but. Parents have this anxiety, like this at least low-level anxiety about their child turning out a certain way. You know, they, they put so much work and effort into raising the child and trying to do it right, according to, you know, whatever they believe that is, give them good ideals. So they, they want to be very careful about influences that aren't them. And that kind of comes through in this film where it's like, well, this music can take them down a wrong path, so we'd really like to protect them from it. But how it ends up playing to the actual kids is they're trying to keep me from enjoying life. They're trying to keep me from experiencing things that are fun and that I'm interested in and that I really want to do. And really that just turns into they're just trying to make me miserable. And we've all been there. We were all children at some point, And I know you felt that at some point with your parents that you were like, they're just trying to make me miserable now. But then when you grow up, you realize that's not really the case. Sometimes they were in the right, sometimes they were in the wrong, but you understand it more, if you know what I'm saying. So anyway, that's all I have to say about Black Roses. It was a fun time. Uh, so I'm going to have to rate this in two ways as I do films like this. One, in the pantheon of all films, how am I rating it? And two, as a so bad it's good film, how am I rating it? So in the pantheon of all films, it's a one-star film. 100% it's a one-star film. But as a So Bad It's Good film, it's a solid three-star film in my opinion. And if you like So Bad It's Good films, I would definitely recommend that you uh, check that this out and also recommend it to other people who are into that stuff. But regardless, I really thank you for checking this out. Go ahead and put some comments down here, especially if you've seen Black Roses and you want to talk about it. Let's do that. Or just like horror in general. I'm open. Uh, but do me a quick favor and hit that subscribe button. If you can do that for me, I would greatly appreciate it. It literally takes you a second. It is very painless. It costs you nothing, and I appreciate it greatly. I really honestly do. That's what keeps me motivated to keep doing the videos because I'm just doing this as a way to, you know, have a nerdy horror community to talk with because where I live, I don't have anyone I can get super nerdy with when it comes to horror. So you are my community. You are my people, basically. I'm reaching out. So please hit that subscribe button. Also, hit the notification bell button, and that way I uh, you'll, you'll know whenever I have a new video going up, whether it's one of these in-depth reviews, one of my 
spoiler free ones for newer films or unboxings or any of that stuff but regardless i really do thank you for taking your time to watch this i do appreciate that and until next time keep it brutal